Well, good evening again. Um, so this evening, we are going to be wrapping up the book of Titus in chapter 3. And next week, Pastor Dale will kind of come along and, I kind of say, string the pearls together for our adornment as he takes each overview of the Bible, of the, of the book of Titus, and, and kind of give a summary and pull some probably principles and applications we can from the entire book. But for us, we're just going to wrap up the book this evening in chapter 3. So let's begin. Paul has been giving Titus instruction on healthy church structure and protection. There are essentially two parts to the structure. Paul wrote to have order within and also to protect protection from without. The internal structure could consist of qualified elder, elders and a teaching order. At the same time, Paul warned against external attacks, usually in the form of false teachers. Usually the disease of division comes from outside sources. Although false teachers may arise from within, teaching sound doctrine can provide protection from such threats. Therefore, to preserve a healthy church body, it must do two things. One, function well internally, and two, protect itself externally. And the fuel for such protection and provision is the grace of God. The more we comprehend the love of Christ in the gospel, the more we will understand his grace. And that grace fuels our affections and desires to inspire us to submit completely to Christ and his word. As a result, this will have an outward effect on how we live. This was the power-enabling grace that Pastor Tim spoke of last week. I'm going to move this off this here. In chapter 3, Paul moves uh, from protection and provision to proper conduct in the world. He does not write, Paul does not write to the people of God exhorting them to hunker down in their bunkers, rather quite the opposite. But How? How are we to conduct ourselves as transformed people in a fallen and depraved world? It's easy to look out into the world and become discouraged, isn't it? There appears to be a rapid escalation of immorality and a sense of this ungodliness. Ideas and practices condemned just a few generations ago are now being fully accepted and even defended. Some of us fear for our own children. I've heard it said, how can you raise children in today's culture? And some of us, even more for our grandchildren. The PC culture drives the decisions of our governmental authorities. Every group has a label, and each label demands representation, whether it is warranted or not. They demand equality. They call for tolerance of all beliefs. Unless you're a Christian... We get labeled bigots, intolerant, and self-serving. Our leaders are driven by personal political power and financial gain, and we appear to be absolutely powerless to do anything about it. And as one author put it, there's a growing spirit of antagonism toward government, a growing pessimism toward institutions, and a growing attitude of isolation among believers, abandoning the culture entirely and basically heading for the hills, saying, the city of man is going to hell, so I'll just give my attention and time and money and energy to the city of God. When we look with eyes that only see the disease, it's easy to become cynical and saddened. If we allow ourselves to sit in the muck and the mire of this depraved world looking out across it, we become fearful and isolated. Or worse, if we're not careful, we will make us angry. We become hostile and want to lash out against it. As a result, some of us, we desire to retreat to our castles, build our walls of protections, and protect us from the outside world, keeping it away. We may even stand above on our pedestals, shoot our fiery darts, screaming for change 
maybe proclaiming the word of God from a distance. And after assessing the culture, who could blame you to have such an attitude? But is this the gospel? Did Jesus say, repent and believe, then go make yourselves fortresses? Keep your distance from the Sodom of Gomorrah's from today. Are we to remove ourselves from society? Let me remind you of Jesus' final instructions to his disciples. In Matthew 28, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And he didn't stop there because he finished with, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, the world is not our enemy in a way. It's our mission field. Until we see the world for what it is, a diseased body in which we only have its cure, we will only allow it to defeat us. And this is where we pick up this evening with Paul's final instructions in this letter. And they include how we are to live as lights in a world that is hostile toward our great God and King. So let's turn with me to chapter 3 of Titus. And before we begin, let's pray. Father, I, we need you to help us understand and comprehend your word at its depth. Even if it's just surface, that we can understand what you are communicating to us through this holy book. Arrogant for me to stand up here and think that my words will proclaim any change without the word of God speaking for itself. But I know I need you. And we need you. We are nothing apart from you. We can do no good apart from you. So we ask that you would work your spirit through my words as I convey your word, that it would have its effect on our hearts and our affections, our emotions, that it would change us, the way we think, the way we understand and what we believe, so that it has a transforming effect, an outward effect on the how we live. That's the message of Titus, chapter 3 this evening. So help us and help me. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Follow along with me as I read chapter 3, the first two verses. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Paul begins with a series of reminders, not with new instructions. He says, remind them. We should read these reminders as something that is to be done continually. In other words, read it as saying, keep on reminding the believers these things. It's not a one and done. Rather, it's a recall these things over and over again. Isn't this needed among us? If you're like me, we have short memories. I can become so easily distracted and thrown off the path. For me, it only takes a news report, a social media post, or even just hearing, overhearing a conversation where I work. I quickly get emotionally drawn into the world and all of its muck and the struggles and sin that's out there. And then I start cascading down the side of sinful anger and disgust. My thoughts run through these messages, and before long, I'm speaking my opinion in my mind and posting it everywhere. I'll be spewing out some sort of verbal tirade against any leadership or public opinion. These moments only reveal how much I need to be continually reminded of the gospel. You see, in the island of Crete, they had a reputation of always being on the verge of revolt. They hated Roman rulers, 
and were always plotting some sort of conflict. There was political unrest. Remember, they were liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. Not much probably different than what we see today. But according to Paul, that was no excuse for rebellion or disobedience for the church in Crete. So what about us? We don't live in an oppressive rulers and authorities. We may feel like it sometimes, but it's far from anything that exists in other places in the world. In fact, we live in a country where individualism and freedom reign. We may legally participate in protest and even civil disobedience. According to Paul, it doesn't matter. We are to be submissive and obedient to whomever is ruling over us. That includes supervisors, teachers, elders, parents, you name it. But aren't there exceptions? What about instances of sin? Does Paul mean we are to blindly obey all authorities Even when we're asked or commanded to sin? Of course not. We are not to violate the word of God. The question is, how do you respond in these situations? Do you respond with aggression and anger? Or with a quiet resolve? And what about the qualifications to our obedience? What about the leaders we submit to? Does the character of the leader have any impact on our obedience? No. Our obedience is not contingent on their character of the ruler or any authority. Respect does not determine our obedience. We obey regardless of the character or the wisdom of the leader. They don't have to earn our respect as believers. We don't qualify our obedience. We give it regardless. But it doesn't stop here. We are to be ready for every good work. This means to have a posture, ready to act, poised to respond to the needs of others. This text encourages us, I think, to be involved with whomever we live and work with. We should be involved in their lives and connected to to them so that we even know and recognize the need when it's available, when it rises. That's being a light in the darkness. Are you poised to serve unbelievers, even those who are hostile to God? Are you ready to serve them in word and deed? It's one thing to say, I will pray for you or give them encouragement. It's another to give of your time and of your efforts and your money. Jesus gave us a pretty clear example, a parable on this from the Good Samaritan, of what that looks like. Paul continues this list of reminders, next addressing our speech. Paul sets the bar high with the speak evil of no one phrase. That is a high calling. The weight of this reminder should press down on us heavily. Gossip runs amok in our society and unfortunately in our churches too. It's, it's almost become accepted practice to complain about leadership, right, and authority. That, that's what everyone does. In our country, we dress it up as our right to freedom of speech. Paul does not give us that excuse. The reminder is clear. We are to speak evil of no one. That means no one outside the church, no one inside the church, and especially, especially inside the church, and no one outside the church. And if we carefully watch our words, as you'll read through this list, we'll then avoid the next reminder, quarreling. Arguments and quarrels were signs of false teachers. We saw that in chapter 1. God's people avoid quarrels. We are to work hard to be at peace with everyone. But in our, in our culture, we, we prize the ones who can win the verbal clashes, don't we? Some Christians search for arguments and quarrels in order to claim their spot in the land. They're ready to dig their heels and to stir up dissension in the name of Christ. As if intellectual acumen is king. Let me remind you, Jesus was a lamb led to the slaughter. And not a word of defiance proceeded from his mouth. Is that you? 
Is that your character? Now, I'm not saying that we are not to defend the truth. But Peter says it like this. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. That's not the way the world operates. That's the way the kingdom operates. It's not a matter of if we defend the truth, but rather how we defend the truth. Is your defense out of love or personal pride? Do you view those who question your faith as lost souls needing salvation or personal enemies? And then hence, as we continue down our list, we are to be gentle. The word mean, here means patiently steadfast amid injustice. That's the idea. Our culture prides itself on aggressive of in-your-face sound bites. And as one author put it, our interchanges are confrontational, divisive, and dismissive. Balance and fairness are casualties of the evening show as two, three, and sometimes four voices contend simultaneously for dominance. Volume and stubbornness are the new civic virtues. With the ease of live feeds and recordings, we all have a voice, right? Therefore, speak it. That's what, our, that's what our culture says. This is not our conduct. If we're facing injustice, and you, you will, if you're a believer, then you are to respond with patience and gentleness. We are not to attack nor seek retaliation. Finally, Paul wraps up this list with show perfect courtesy toward all people. The NLT says it like this. Show true humility to everyone. This is not a doormat Christianity. It takes greater spiritual strength to love when being persecuted or mistreated. It takes greater spiritual strength to humbly serve those who are your enemies. Only those who have faith in the sovereign Lord will respond to an evil world in this way. You have to have a high view of God and his sovereignty. Our flesh desires to respond as Peter did in the Garden of Gethsemane. Doesn't, at least mine does. That was not the way of our Savior. He commanded the sword to be put away, and he healed the soldier's ear. A good work. And as, one, as another author put it, the world well understands infighting and backbiting, but what wins the gospel, a gospel, what wins a gospel hearing from unbelievers is a very different pattern in the church. Those in the church are to model peaceableness, consideration, especially with each other. And how? The answer lies in the willingness to show true humility toward all men. So where does this humility come from? It remembers the gospel, as Paul is going to tell us. Let's continue down to chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. In fact, I will just stick with chap uh, verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. So let's stop here. Paul began this chapter with remind them. Now he shifts the reminder to include himself and Titus. Did you catch it? For we ourselves... Even the most dedicated, God-loving, Christ-exalting believer remembers who he was. This is the pathway to humility and obedience. There's an old saying that for those who achieve a high degree of success, they'll say, never forget where you came from. This is exactly what Paul is saying here. We were all once depraved in our reasoning, in our desires, and in, in our relationships. Remember this, when you're asked to give a reason for the hope that is in you and the world looks at you as though you were a fool, remember that was once you. When you see and encounter unbelievers who love their sin, even if it causes pain and suffering, remember that once was you. When you see relationships torn apart by pride and selfish gain, remember that once was you. 
And if this isn't enough, may we not be blind to our own current sinfulness because we are not yet fully transformed. We have no excuse. We know the truth. Never forget this. The sheer fact we judge unbelievers and condemn, condemn them exposes our forgetfulness. Do you shake your heads and disgust at the sin and foolishness in the world? Do you wonder, why don't people choose Christ, or how could they do that? If so, then you have forgotten. Every single day, we need to remember what we once were. Never forget where you came from. Lest we become discouraged, stop here recalling what we once were, Paul, thankfully, is not finished. He continues with the rest of the gospel. So let's pick up in verse 4 through 8. But when the goodness, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to God, to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. What a beautiful conjunction. But, despite being guilty of every single thing on the list in in, in verse 3, God still came looking for us. We are not what we once were because God is good, God is kind, and God is merciful. When we were depraved in our thoughts, our desires, and our relationships, he came after us. When he appeared, he came to his own, and they rejected him. But he still came. As one person put it, he came to our sewer, he moved into our slave quarters, he inhabited our slums, We weren't even looking for him. He came looking for us. We were destined for death. Like little lemmings following one another over the edge of the cliff, one after the other, he came and saved us. He plucked us out of the line and gave us new life, and that is the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior. And Paul includes the phrase here, not because of works done by us in righteousness. Paul understands the human heart. It so desperately wants some sort of credit for earning some part of our our salvation, as if we've done something to garner some act of God in our life. But he makes it perfectly clear. We contributed nothing to our salvation. In the words of Jonathan Edwards, the only contribution we made to our salvation was our sin. And that sin, thankfully, has been removed by the blood of Christ. And he continues, Paul, here to, to go to great lengths to ensure us we understand that we had no part in securing our salvation. Our justification was completely secured by his grace through the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. You see, regeneration takes place in a moment right? renewal is a lifetime process. And don't equate this washing with baptism. I don't think that's the idea here. It's a cleansing first and then an indwelling next. As a result of the Holy Spirit's Spirit's work, we are now justified before a holy and righteous God. This means every single thought and every single sinful thought and deed is completely purged from our record, making it spotless as the righteousness of Christ. That's what he sees in us. And if that was not enough, he gives us a place in this kingdom for eternity. And in fact, it is ours at this very moment. No sin will take that away from us, except the one that blasphemes the Holy Spirit. These truths must remain in our minds, lest we forget our great salvation and defame the name of Christ by our conduct. That's what Paul's getting to here. Hence, Paul's command to insist on these things in verse 8. He even affirms their trustworthiness. These things are trustworthy. The written word is trustworthy. The written word is for us to be reading and contemplating and and devouring as much as we can so our minds don't drift away from the truth. When we read this final push at the end of this letter, we should hear it as one passionately encouraging us to trust these words. I think of a coach as, as a coach screaming 
uh, to the athlete as they are running down to cross the finish line in it's a neck and neck race. And this passionate plea to continually preach the gospel is not reserved for elders alone here. Did you notice that? It's for the whole people. It's for all of us. We should all be encouraging one another in the gospel. We have short memories. Our conduct will only sincerely change when we truly understand all that Christ has done for us. Then we will devote ourselves to good works to proclaim Christ as Savior. And these exhortations, as you notice, are excellent and profitable for people. This is the doing. It's the reading and proclaiming the truth and understanding the word of God. That's what's excellent and produces change. But, need, but not only do we need to remember what to affirm, uh, we need to remember what to avoid. Let's pick up in verses 9 through 11. But avoid, avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, and he is self-condemned. Distractions over unprofitable discussions will always cause division and destroy the pattern of church stability. Let, let, let's, just, let's not major on the minors and allow divisions to spring up over foolish controversies. If God has not revealed something in Scripture for us to know, then leave it alone. There's nothing explicitly in stated in the Word of God on how we are school our children or whether or not dating is an acceptable practice. People will spend time developing an argument for that, and that's fine, but don't let that be what divides us. Foolish controversies are those Paul describes with the false teachers in this chapter 1. He, he's described those as those devoted to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. The point is not to avoid... Relevant issues confronting the church, right? Things that we are facing in our, in our current society and culture, we need as a church to have an answer to or, or, or teach each other or teach you how to respond to these situations that are rising. Transgenderism is an example. And it's going to be other, for the youth, there are other struggles you're going to face in your life that you haven't been revealed yet to you. We should be addressing new challenges that face the church, yes. But we are as a people so in, but are we as a people so inwardly focused at each other that we seek to pick apart everything someone says or does? Let's major on the majors. Gospel, justification by faith alone, yeah, worth fighting over. Some of these others, not so sure. In other words, keep the main thing the main thing, and that is the gospel. The world is full of division. The church must live counterculturally by living in unity. Paul gives clear instruction, too, on how to handle one who causes division over worthless ideas. Two warnings and have nothing to do with them. He holds nothing back in describing, does he? He calls them warped, sinful, and self-condemned. All right? That's not politically correct, politically correct today. Those are strong words. He doesn't even indicate that we attempt to work with them or show them much grace here, right? If they're causing that much division, depart from them. Warn them twice, have nothing to do, more to do with them. Paul wraps up this letter uh, remembering the people. So let's finish with verses 12 to 15. When I send Artemis or Tychius to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I've decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in faith. Grace be with you all. I'm short on time here. so Paul is exemplified by what he instructed Titus in the church structure. He continues to prepare others to do the work of the gospel. Even though he will settle in a location for a time, he is still continually sending and training others. Right? His work is not done. If this letter was written near the end of his life, then we see he continues to teach and train in the work of the ministry to the very end. It has not ended for him, and it should never end for us. We are to continue to teach and train men for ministry. 
And youth, as you sit there, that's what's happening to you as you go through your classes and you raise up in the church, that you are being taught and trained for some future position you may hold. You may not understand that or realize that yet. You may wonder what you're doing and where you're going, but God's got a plan. You have to trust by faith, by not seeing what the next step is. And by the grace of God, Clear Creek Chapel will be here for years to come because we have fulfilled the ministry of the church by putting into order, establishing qualified leadership, and instructing the people in sound doctrine. And what flows from this structure is a transformed people. Three times in this chapter, Paul alludes to good works. In verse 1, he says, be ready for every good work. In verse 8, those who believe in God are to be careful to devote themselves to good works. And finally here again, learn to devote themselves to good works. We are to be a people, a church, that is devoted to living out what we know and what we believe. Understanding the gospel will result in a transformed life. And a transformed life will do what it says it believes, and this is being devoted to good works. Good, that, it, you see the outflow here? Some people work backwards. If I do good works, i will be justified before God. It will make me saved. And yet the flow is just quite the opposite. Read, know, believe, do. So in, to wrap up here in our reflect and respond, do you exemplify a life transformed by the gospel? Are you living a life submissive to rulers and authorities, ready for every good work and loving others? Do you fully understand the gospel in such a way that you're gripped by the mercy of God? Or do you look at the world with disdain and disgust at all the sin you see? Then you have forgotten where you came from. Or do you get caught up in biblical debates that prove unprofitable? Or do you seek the unity for the sake of the gospel? Let us pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your word, and sometimes I know I don't hold it high enough in my life or pursue it with as much passion and fervor as I have done other things in my life. And so forgive me. Forgive us for us for, us for having really a low view of your grace and your mercy and your goodness and kindness toward us. Keep reminding us through your people in this church and the preachers on this podium and the teachers in this church that we need you and what you have done and where we came from and where you have brought us to so that we will be devoted to good works. We will look outside of ourselves knowing that we have the light of the gospel and, the, and to the glory of his name that brings salvation to those who will listen and hear and believe. In Christ's name we pray, amen.